12 through 14, this will be for the new international version. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Hello, church. Good morning. Good to see everybody here. As always, I just wanted to start out today with a few photos to show you. Uh, here's the first one. You know, this is a um, super cool baby, it even though it's had a wave already. Uh, the second one is this young boy riding his bike. The third is a lady working hard in the kitchen. And fourth are these proud parents. Uh, you can't really see their faces, but I'm imagining that they're just beaming, you know, watching their daughter at their graduation. Now, I have a question for you looking at these pictures. There's four different stages of growth here, right? Four different stages of life. Which life or which stage of life is the most valuable in your mind? Which is the most valuable? Is it the baby, the, the child, the young adult or the adult or the, or the parent? I mean, it's a tough question to answer, right? And I think we'd probably have to conclude that there is, there is really no answer because they're all equally valuable. Each stage of life has its, its good things. They're all valuable for their own ways. And they each have equal worth. And I, I want you to hold on to that idea this morning. Hold on to that message because it really undergirds everything that we're planning to talk about this morning and, and really everything we're planning to talk about for this whole month. We've reached April and along with that is a new mini-series in our, uh, our year talking about spiritual growth and maturity in 2024. This month, we want to look through the different stages of spiritual growth. Uh, and just like there are different stages of, of physical growth in the human body, uh, as we just saw in those pictures there, there's also different stages of spiritual growth. And the Bible uses language for us to see that those sp stages of spiritual growth exist as well. Did you know that? Have you thought about that before? I'll give you a few examples. Uh, just like we have physical infants, for instance, uh, we also have spiritual infants. We see this concept come up in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verse 1, where Paul says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you. Uh, as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Mere infants in Christ. So this is from 1 Corinthians, and I hope you'll see a theme here. All four of these stages are laid out in 1 Corinthians. We have spiritual infants here, but we also have spiritual children. Look at what Paul says here in, verse, uh, in chapter 4, verse 17. He says, That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved uh, and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. So we have spiritual children too. Uh, and the next verse refers to people who are spiritually mature, and we also call them uh, spiritual adults. Here's what it said in, in chapter 14, verse 20. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. There's that word again. In regard to evil, be infants. We already saw that too. But in your thinking, be adults or be mature. We also see this language here, right? We see kind of three stages all in one in this verse. We have the children, the infants, and the adults. Uh, and just like we have adults, we also have spiritual parents. And this is the way that Paul refers to himself in chapter 4 in verse 15. He says, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Fathers, For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. So there it is. You know, the Bible describes these four different stages of spiritual growth. Have you ever thought about where you're at in this growth process? Where are you in your spiritual growth? How do we know what each stage looks like? Well, this month, we're planning to walk through each of these four stages of spiritual growth with the goal of answering just kind of three simple questions for each stage. Here they are. How does the Bible describe each stage? What does each stage need in order to grow? And third, what can the church do to help with that? How can the church help in that growth? So that's, that's our, our framework for April. And it's helpful, I think, to identify where we're at in our growth, not just for the sake of information, right? But, 
but more importantly, for the sake of transformation, for growing. It's like, a, it's like when you're looking at a map. I don't know if anybody remembers paper maps. <laughs> uh, I used to look at them way back, but it, if, if you're not used to using one, you need to know two things, right? You need to know two very important things when you're navigating a map. Maybe you can think of what that is. Like, first of all, you need to know where your destination is, right? Where are you going? And second, you need to know where you currently are. And, and I guess maybe this might be news to some, but on the paper map, they don't have that little red pin, you know, for your destination. And they don't have the little blue dot either for where you currently are. So you have to kind of figure these things out. We've already established, though, this year we've been talking about spiritual growth, right? We know what the destination is for us. The destination is Jesus. It's destination Jesus. The destination or the goal of spiritual growth is to be like Him, to become more like Him. That's our destination. But we also need to know where we currently are. Where's that little blue dot in your life? Well, if we know where we are and, and we know where we want to go, then we can, really, we can really start growing. We can really start moving towards our destination. And that's what this month is about. But you know what, just like these stages can also help us to grow better, uh, grow more spiritually in our own lives, they can also help us to, to look at our brothers and sisters and help them grow as well. When we know where someone's at, it's easier to help them grow. You know, it, and it makes sense in the physical realm, right? If you're caring for a young baby, for instance, you're never going to try to like feed them a steak, right? That's just not going to happen. If you wanted to help a toddler learn a new skill, you probably wouldn't start with mowing the lawn. Uh, if you were trying to feed an adult, it would be weird to offer them baby food. Or if you were helping a master's student learn new skills, it would be strange to help them with counting, right? And, and in the same way, we're trying to help people grow spiritually, right? But we need to recognize that the best way that we can provide to help that person to grow, it, it will be different depending on where they're at. We can't just assume that everyone is at the same stage and use a one-size-fits-all approach for everybody, and while we're on that topic, and I, I want to really point this out and stress this, um, let's just make it very clear that the different stages of spiritual growth, they, are not, uh, they don't align with different levels of importance. We're not talking about people being more or less important than others. Just like the physical growth stages, right? The, those pictures we showed at the start, the baby, the child, the adult, the parent. Nobody would say that the baby is more valuable than the parent or, or vice versa. Nobody would say that the child is more valuable than the adult. People have equal worth, regardless of what stage they're at. And, and it's the same thing with spiritual growth. If, you, if you're a spiritual infant, you're no more valuable than a spiritual adult and vice versa. And we see this show up in the scriptures. Uh, same book again, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. It says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. It's noteworthy that Paul said, the same thing, said these words here in the same letter that he used to describe those different stages of spiritual growth, right? We're not all going to be at the same stage, but that doesn't mean that we have different levels of importance or that some people are worth more or less than others. The world might operate like that, but not in the church. Paul says that those who, uh, are in the body, those who are in the body of Christ who might seem to be weaker by the standards of this world are not treated that way in the church. In the church, we don't, we don't operate like the world operates when it comes to the worth of people. If you're a part of the body of Christ, you're an equal, period. Regardless of where you're at in your spiritual journey, you matter just the same. And, and that's important for us to know going into this. The important thing is not where you are now. The important thing is the direction that you're headed. And that direction needs to be towards Jesus. And that's the thing that we all share in common. No matter where we're at in our growth, we're all striving for the same thing. We're all striving to be more like Jesus. There's nothing wrong with being at the beginning of that journey. But there is something wrong with being stuck at the beginning of that journey or stuck in the middle or stuck at the end. No matter where you are, there is something wrong with being stuck and not growing. And that's true regardless of what stage you're at. We are all called to grow, to continually become more and more like Jesus. So, where are you at right now? 
It might not be altogether obvious. For instance, uh, a common misconception is that years of being a Christian uh, equals spiritual growth. And, and that's not always the case, though. It makes me think about the story of the man uh, who worked at a company for, for 25 years. He was working in the same company, doing the same job for the same pay. And finally, he went to his boss and he demanded a raise. You know, he said, after all, I've been working here and I have a quarter century of experience. And his boss looked at him and sighed and he said, oh, my dear fellow, you haven't a quarter century of experience. You had one experience for a quarter of a century. <laughs> and, and the moral of the story, I think, in that, in that story is that just being somewhere for a long time doesn't necessarily mean that you're growing. And, and it's the same in the church, right? Just being in a church environment for a long time doesn't necessarily mean that you're growing in Christ. It's possible for a Christian to be a Christian for 40 years and still be a spiritual infant or a spiritual child. So speaking of spiritual infants, let's turn our attention there now because it's the first one. Today we want to focus on that first stage of spiritual growth and answer those three questions that we talked about. Who is a spiritual infant anyway? Uh, what does a spiritual infant need to grow? And, and third, how can I help with that? How can the church contribute to that growth. So let's start with a description. Um, unsurprisingly, it turns out that there's a lot of parallels between spiritual infants and physical infants. What comes to your mind when you think about a baby? You know, probably the first thing is that they're really cute, and that's obvious. But we're not really here to talk about much about physical appearance today. We're talking about abilities, right? The Bible describes spiritual infants as unaware they just don't really know much about life in the kingdom of God. They, they haven't learned it yet. Uh, it's kind of, with a spiritual infant, um, they, they, might just, they might just not have a good understanding of things at this point. The Bible also describes spiritual infants as dependent. Like a, like a physical infant, right? A spiritual infant is not really able to feed themselves or care for themselves spiritually. And finally, the Bible describes a spiritual infant as worldly. Worldly, the, there hasn't really been a lot of change yet in their life from what life was like before their birth into Christ. So we're going to go through those today. I'm going to go through some scriptures to point those things out. And as we do, I hope you're able to kind of self-reflect on your own life and see where these things might describe maybe where you're at right now. And I think it's important to start with ourselves here, right? It's so easy to think about that person next to you or maybe your friend or your spouse or, or a child or whatever. But, but let's start with us. I, would, I just encourage all of us today to start with thinking about ourselves. Jesus said uh, to take the plank out of your own eye before we worry about the speck in our brothers. And I think that's a good principle for us to start with as we go through this. So let's consider our reading today. In verse 13, the writer points out that he's speaking to spiritual infants. And, and we see those characteristics we talked about earlier, right? It says that they, they simply just don't know what God's Word says about a righteous life. They're unaware of the truth and about themselves. And, and much of their thinking about right and wrong might be still based on the standards of the world that they have come from. They don't know a lot about the Scriptures. They don't know a lot about God. Uh, they may not know about things that differ from different religions, and they may think, well, maybe other religions can be true too, and, and, and we can sort of put them all together. They may not understand the point of being a part of the church community, and they might not see the value in it. And by the way, this isn't meant to be derogatory in any way. It's just simply a description. This is where the process of growth begins, and if you're there right now, that's totally fine. But what isn't fine is getting stuck there or getting stuck in any stage for that matter, you can sense the frustration, right, in, in verse 12 in the, in the Hebrew writer's tone. But he's not frustrated because they were spiritual infants. It's because those infants should have already been growing, but they weren't. They were refusing to do so. They were stuck. That was the problem. Being stuck was the problem, not the fact that they were infants. And being a disciple of Jesus as we've already said, is, is more about the direction you're heading than where you currently are. We also see in verse 12 that the infants were very much still dependent on others. They need someone to teach them. 
Just like a, with a physical infant, someone needs to feed them. And it's the same with a spiritual infant. They're not yet at the point where they could feed themselves. They need someone to teach them and show them about the ways of God. And finally, the spiritual infant is also worldly. And again, this isn't meant to be derogatory. It's just what it looks like when you're starting out in your life in Christ. It's only by learning and practicing God's word, as it talks about here in verse 14, that you begin to grow out of that. You begin to grow up in Christ. The infant is called to leave behind the ways of the world and start living for the ways of God. And Paul also points this out in, in 1 Corinthians, in verses 1 to 3 of chapter 3. He said, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it yet. Or you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? The, the infants in Christ were considered infants because they were still living in the ways of the world. Instead of being controlled by the Spirit, they were being controlled by jealousy, and they were fighting amongst themselves. Does this describe maybe where you're at right now? Paul says that this is the life that the infant needs to move away from, to grow out of. So that's, that's a spiritual infant in terms of a description. The Bible describes them as unaware, dependent, worldly. And that's, and that's what we need. We need that description to help us with these next two questions. First of which is, what does an infant need to grow? If you think this might describe where you're at right now, what do you need? What, what are the scriptures saying to you that can really help you grow from where you're at? Well, the first thing is what uh, the Apostle Peter points out in 1 Peter 2, verses 1 to 2. He said, so put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. And like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up in your salvation. We can all benefit from these instructions, for sure. But the language here makes it especially applicable for those who are young in their faith. This message is actually really simple. Turn from the ways of the world, turn from the evil ways, and turn to God. It's quite, it's quite straightforward. Uh, anything malicious in your life, anything deceitful, anything hypocritical, anything that's based on envy, any practices that involve slander, turn from those things. Leave those things behind. That was the way of the old way of life that you used to live, and that life is over. It's gone now. The new life is found in Jesus, so the new life where we live on the spiritual milk of God's Word. And that's the life we need to turn to. We need to develop an appetite for it, to hunger and thirst for the things of God, to pursue those things instead of the ways of the world. This will help the infant, this will really help anybody uh, grow into Christ. And so the next thing that the spiritual in can, infant rather can do to grow is to devote themselves to God and to his people. In Ephesians 4, we see this. The Apostle Paul, he's talking about the importance of the church in terms of spiritual growth. What does the church have to do with growing together in the body of Christ? And in Ephesians 4, he says that the leaders of the church are supposed to equip people to do the work of ministry that Jesus has called all of us to do. And when we all work together as a body, this is going to happen. From Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, it says, Then we will no longer be infants. Tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. So when everyone in the church functions as a minister, the minister that Jesus calls them to be, the spiritual infants among us will certainly grow. They certainly will. Instead of being tossed around by the world, they will begin to mature in their faith. And it says here that this will happen when everyone in the church um, is speaking the truth in love to one another. It's so important for us to get this, this point, I think. You know, as, as the church... We need to be there for one another. And we need to realize, especially the spiritual infants among us, need to realize how important it is to be a part of that body 
The church is so important if you want to grow in your faith. It's a truth that we just simply must accept. Being a Christian is not something you can do in isolation. It doesn't work. You need the church for this. For those of us who are spiritual infants, please don't take this lightly. Be with the church. And I don't, I don't mean just like being in this building on Sunday morning. I mean building relationships and interacting with the people of God on a regular basis in your life. Let them help you mature. These are the people in your life that can speak the truth and love to you. They can help you grow in maturity. And this is exactly what we see in the example of the early church. If you remember back in the book of Acts in chapter 2, you know, Peter, the apostle Peter, preaches this amazing sermon about Jesus dying and raising again. And he preaches about the kingdom of God. And then a whole bunch of people, like 3,000 people, uh, respond and, and, and they're baptized and they give their lives to Christ. It's an incredible thing. But holy man, that's a lot of spiritual infants all at once, right? Like 3,000 new Christians. What were they doing? How were they developing in their faith? Well, here it is in verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayer. They grew from their infancy by devoting themselves to God and devoting themselves to God's people. They learned the teachings of Jesus from the apostles. They spent time with each other. They lived in fellowship together. They broke bread. They prayed they were with the church always, and it helped them to grow. If you're a spiritual infant today, God's plan for growth for you is still the same. Pursue righteousness and holiness and devote yourself to God and his people. So let's move on to the, the final, the third question here. What can we do as a church to help our spiritual infants grow in their faith? Maybe the best way to find this answer is to look at what Jesus did. And his example is great, as always. And it, it, comes, it comes down to one word, really. How can the church, uh, how can you and I help spiritual infants to grow well? We can share with them. We can share with them. That's what Jesus did. And, and there are three things in your life in particular that you can share with spiritual infants. You can share your own life, first of all by building a relationship with our younger brothers and sisters in the faith. And this is really where everything starts. This is, this is really a foundation. And in that relationship, you can share the truth of God's word with them. The relationship will allow for this to occur naturally, and it needs to be done with love. Speaking the truth in love. It's something we already talked about. And we also can share new habits with them. By living life together, we can show them what we're doing to live for God and what that looks like for them on a day-to-day -day basis. Jesus set a, an amazing example of this for us in Luke chapter 5. It was right near the beginning of his ministry. He was just sort of starting to call his disciples to follow him. And at this early stage, his followers were indeed infants in their faith. They literally just began following Jesus. So what did he do to help them? What did he do? Well, did he point out all the problems in their life? Did he hold a lecture every Thursday and, and tell them to come and learn about what it means to live for God? No. <laughs> no. He, we find him sharing with them. Sharing with them. Look at what it says in verse, uh, sorry, Luke 5, verses uh, 27 to 32. It said, after this, Jesus went out and saw the tax collector, uh, saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were uh, eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do, you, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What Jesus did here was so important. Now, the situation that, uh, that he was in here is something that the the spiritual leaders of his time would not have touched with like a 10-foot pole. <laughs> uh, they wanted nothing to do with spiritual infants like this. They were too messy. But Jesus did. He came for these people. He went to Levi's house and he ate with him and his friends. He shared his life. 
He shared his life. He was willing to build a relationship with him and his friends. And, and in doing so, in, in building that relationship, he was able to help them grow. And grow they did. You know, Jesus shared his life, but he shared new truth with them too. He shared the truth of God's word. He shared new habits with them along the way. That's really what we read about in the rest of the Gospel of Matthew, right? It's the story of Jesus working with his disciples. He taught them how to pray. He, he taught them how to understand uh, and apply Scripture to their lives. He taught them how to serve. He taught them how to minister to others. And because of this, they grew in their faith. And today, church, I want all, all of us to see that Jesus' approach can be our approach too. Jesus' methods needs to be the method that we use with the spiritual infants among us. It all comes down to that one word, sharing. Making that investment and sharing our lives with them. It's like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, again, no surprise. He said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Helping an infant grow is about so much more than sharing information. Try, try doing that with a physical infant. You know, you're trying to teach them how to eat maybe. Give them an instruction manual about how to eat their dinner. You'll be fine, right? <laughs> They're not going to be fine. That's not going to work. And, and it sh it's not really going to work with a spiritual infant either. They need someone to make an investment. They need someone to share their life, the truth, new habits with them. To look at their own life as an example of what it means to live for Christ. Jesus did it. Paul did it. And we can do that same thing today. So the Bible describes the infant as someone who is just unaware of the truth. Someone who is dependent on others. Someone who hasn't grown out of the ways of the world yet. Maybe that's you. And if it is, I hope you're encouraged by the fact that God is thrilled to have you as his child. You are not less than. Even where you are right now. But his love for you is calling you forward. It's calling you into growth. He wants to give you that abundant life that Jesus has for you. And he's calling you. He's calling all of us to grow closer to him. That's the common thread that's true of all four of these stages of spiritual growth that we're planning to look at this month. But maybe you realize that we missed one here. I don't know if anyone realized that. Before any of this new life happens, there's one more stage. It's the spiritually unborn person. This is the person who's not yet taken hold of that new life in Jesus. And if that's where you're at today, I just want you to know that this church family here loves you. We love you and we're so thankful to have you in this community and we welcome you here. And more importantly, you need to know that God loves you too. He loves you so much that he has made a way for you to be reborn into a new life. Uh, this new life that we've been talking about today. It's the best life you could ask for. This is a life of purpose and hope and meaning. Way more than anything else this world has to offer. He gives you this new life. He offers this new life to you because of his love for you. But also because of his love for you, he's not going to force you to choose that path. That's a free will choice that he has given you to make. You have the choice to accept it or not. But you need to know that without the sacrifice of Jesus in your life, your sin stands between you and this relationship with God that we've been talking about. It separates you from a saving relationship with Him. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that can wash all of that away. But you need to be willing to accept it and be reborn. Be reborn into a new life. Jesus said it best in John 3, verses 3 to 6, when He was speaking with uh, the Pharisee Nicodemus, he said, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born again when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. If you're ready to be reborn today into a new Spirit-filled life, if you're ready to start that new life that, and begin that journey of spiritual growth that we've been talking about, that, that path that Jesus has for you, don't wait. Please don't wait. 
You can be reborn today when you name Jesus as your king, the king of your life. Put your faith in him through repentance, through baptism. Give your life to him. You need this new life. You need to be reborn. We're going to end off with a song called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. The song, I think it really it does a good job of tying in everything that we've been talking about this morning. Um, this is really a decision that we all need to make, deciding to follow Jesus. It's where we, where we need to go in our spiritual growth. We need to make that decision on the daily, you know, to put the world behind us, to set the cross before us, and not to turn back. But the last verse in the song, as, as we're going to see soon, I think is especially fitting for those of us who are trying to encourage the spiritual infants among us to follow Christ. It, it asks the question to the brother or the sister next to you, you know, will you decide now to follow Jesus? I'm going. Are you going to come with me? And, and that's, I think, the attitude that we see Jesus having in his life. And that's, the, and that's the attitude that we can all have in our lives as well. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. May God bless us all as we try to grow in Christ together. Thank you for your time. Let's stand up for the song. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me. The cross before me. It's my first prayer in English, uh, so uh, don't judge me harshly. <laughs> uh, so let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, patience, and mercy in uh, raising us. We thank you that we can gather together, be filled with your Holy Spirit through Bible study, fellowship and prayer for the needs for, of our brothers and sisters. Thank you that you hear uh, us and uh, answer our prayers. Thank you that you heal the sick and give wisdom to doctors to heal. Thank you for protecting our families, our relatives, and our friends. Thank you for filling our uh, hearts uh, with joy, peace, and uh, tranquility. Father, please protect all those who are defending their homes. Please bring them home alive so that they can hug their loved ones. Father, please give us all peace all over the earth. Father, we commit our lives 
into your hands and uh, know that you will take care of everything we need. Grow us and fill us with wisdom. Bring us to eternity and never leave us. We thank you for blessing us with uh, all the abundance of your blessings. Praise be to you, our loving Heavenly Father, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.